Video hey there, this is Tim from Twice Circled, and welcome to episode 4 of the official Mega Aquarium video blog. Now this episode is going to be a little bit different to normal, it's going to be a technical episode. And what that means is, rather than just playing the game and talking about the way the game plays, I'm actually going to be talking about how the game is made because a number of people have expressed an interest in uh, hearing more about this. If that's not you though, if you just like uh, watching the game being played and finding out about how the game is coming along and what new features are in and that sort of thing, then do not worry, you can close this video, come back next week and I will be back with a regular episode. On the other hand, if you are interested in the technical side of things, uh, then keep on watching and let me know what you think and let me know if it's uh, if, if it's a good video and you find it interesting. Um, so this, uh, I use Unity to make this game uh, and this video is going to be, you know, there's not going to be any gameplay in it. I'm going to be showing you uh, a little bit of the Unity editor, although to be honest it's mostly going to be code. Um, and what you're looking at now is the uh, the kind of scene view. So this is kind of very much behind the scenes. You never get to see this normally as a player. Um, and, 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 you know, <laughs> we're following around a little, uh, little fish in the tank. Now, um, a couple of little... Uh, Disclaimers, I guess, to start with. The first is I'm going to be showing code today. Um, and there's two things about that. One, um, if you're not a programmer, uh, then don't worry. The code isn't really the most important part of this video. It's much more important is, is what I, I say about it. Uh, and so I think you'll still get a lot from it if you're interested in the development of games. Even though, you know, if you're not a programmer, you can just listen and I think you'll still get something from it. If you are a programmer, uh, the other disclaimer is uh, none of the code I'm going to be showing you is open source. Uh, you know, I, I own the copyright to all the code, um, and you know, I, I uh, so don't ask me if uh, to share the source code because I've done this sort of thing in the past, and, uh, and people always want to see source code, and uh, I won't be sharing the source code. But on the other hand, if you uh, you know in find some of the patterns that I use interesting, and you want to be inspired by that sort of thing or the way I do things then that is obviously completely fine uh, but yeah I just wanted to make that very clear this is not a, a kind of programming tutorial video uh, where I kind of show you the source code at the end and you can kind of uh, you know copy it it's uh, this is much more about uh, the talking about the the structures that I use to program a game like Mega Aquarium. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, is the way I use Unity. So personally, and it's it's you know each to their own. I don't use the editor very much. Um, so you know, sorry. One final thing I should mention. Uh, I'm going to talk about Unity. Uh, I'm going to probably mention words that are specific to Unity. I'm probably going to mention some technical terms for programming. Um, and, you know, I apologize about that in front in, in advance, but um, there is a limit to um, to kind of how uh, beginner friendly I can keep this video. So I'm pitching it kind of at an intermediate level. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask in the comments. That's no problem. So uh, people who are familiar with Unity as an engine will uh, understand what I mean when I say there is a kind of editor um, way of using it where you, you kind of place a lot of stuff down in the editor, you design your scenes in the editor and you have editor scripts and all this sort of stuff. Personally that's not the way I use it. I have a very uh, code centric approach uh, and then I mainly use Unity as a way of visualizing my simulation. Uh, <laughs> which you can see right now beautifully uh, with the the tank clipping come on move you silly tang come on uh, there we go and I also use it for the getting input into the system you know so user inputs obviously really really easy to do with unity and, and of course it has that cross-platform support which is which is really useful but most of the actual kind of simulation, well the entire simulation, runs outside of the Unity engine on its own thread, uh, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, was there something else? I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to mention about Unity, um, but it escaped my, um, my attention just this minute, so I will leave it there talking about Unity. What I'm going to actually talk about today 
is I'm going to give an overview of the simulation uh, within Megaquarium uh, because I think this is the best way to, it's the best foundation I can give for future talks on this subject and it also, um, it's really the only place I can, I, I, I can start because at the at the core of a game like Mega Aquarium is the, is this simulation. It's it's this uh, idea of a game that kind of actually runs on its own, even if you don't give it any user input, even if um, there is no player character that's running around triggering things. You're essentially creating this world which can exist on its own independently, and I think that's at the very core of it. And and I use you know that idea to to base a lot of the development. Uh, around. So let's look at some code. Um, okay, let's switch over to here. Okay, so this is the first class I'd like to talk to you about. Um, I have this thing called a model thread. So Mega Aquarium is multi-threaded and I um, that actually, people who are familiar with Unity will know that Unity in itself isn't multi-threaded, not certainly not in terms of uh, the, your your code, your your kind of main game code. So I've had to bolt this on myself. I have my own multi-threading framework, um, uh, which I will talk about in more detail. I think in a separate episode. I think in this episode, I'm going to try and keep it pretty uh, specific to uh, this idea of the simulation. Um, but what you you know what you do, uh, what I can tell you right now is the whole simulation runs on its own thread. And um, this allows it to run independently of the visualization within Unity and, um, and if necessary, the, the control input that comes from the player. So if I wanted to, for example, I could set up a model, uh, which is, uh, if you guys are familiar with the term MVC for Model Visualization Controller, um, so this is the data model that runs underneath everything and essentially, you know, it's just ones and zeros. It's just data uh, and theoretically what I can do is actually run this model without uh, anything else, without any uh, visualization at like, you know, 2000 frames a second uh, under the hood and just progress that simulation. So it gives you an idea of kind of the way it's divided up. This is just pure simulation. Uh, it can run completely independently um on its own thread um and yeah what you're looking at now is is the main uh, thread loop of um of the simulation thread which i call the model thread now uh so this the uh this gets started from the main unity thread and run is just the kind of the main loop uh, and what we basically do is um Here we go. I couldn't, I couldn't find my while. <laughs> I was like, where the hell's my while? So basically what we do uh, is we enter here uh, and then we just keep looping around this while loop. And all of this code you're looking at here, um, you're welcome to have a read through if you want. But essentially what it does is it makes sure that our uh, thread runs or this loop runs at a consistent rate. Um, depending on what speed we want to progress the game at. So when you click that button in the game, which makes the speed run faster, it's running at triple speed when you click on that button. What that basically is doing is changing um, some variable somewhere. I'm not sure where it is. It's it's, it's probably at the top. Um, just look in here. Yeah, it's changing something that's going to basically change this target time. Um, oh, there we go. Time step. This time step is going to be based on that, that game speed. Um, and basically that means that um, we don't wait for quite as long uh, between ticks. Uh, you could do this in a really simple way. The, the way this does is we use this thing called a lateness accumulator, uh, which means that if for some reason, for example, if there's some user interaction, which um, uh, actually no, not if there's user interaction, no, if there's, um, if there's a big calculation that needs to be done on the model thread, and it means that it starts to run late, then what we do is we account for that and then we catch up. So for example, if one tick happens to take more than a 60th of a second, uh, if you're running at normal game speed, or more than a uh, 180th of a second, if you're running at triple speed, uh, then what we can do is if the next few ticks don't take so long, then what we can do is just catch up and we, we basically don't wait as long. That's what all this code does. You're welcome to have a little look through it if you want. Uh, but that's not really the, uh, the, the what I want to be talking about today. What I want to be talking about is this idea of having this separate simulation that runs inside um, everything else and, and can run independently uh, of, of the rest of the game. So, 
Um, basically, this do tick is the entry to the simulation. So if we follow that through, um, then we basically uh, this is this is telling the uh, the the game to to. Uh, show the tick number in the in the bottom right corner of the screen um in the editor you don't see that when you when, in any of the videos i've shown you um uh, and here is basically where we we update the model uh, so if we go through to that we get to the next class i want to show you which is the uh model class and again when i say model what i'm referring to is the data model that the simulation runs on um, and this is the entry point for that is the update uh method now Again, people who are familiar with Unity will will be familiar with this update method, but I want to be clear, this is not the same update method uh, that you use in Unity. Uh, this is my own update method because this class does not extend mono behavior. So this update method only gets called by my model thread and it can be called multiple times a frame uh, of a visualization frame if you're running in, in, in fast mode. So the first thing we do is update the tick number and then what we do is we call update on all of the objects within our um, our, our model. And I, I, I almost said scene, but it's not the scene because again, this, this model can exist completely in data. Um, and again, people who are familiar with Unity will see a very similar style here in that what I basically do is I've, I've kind of taken that Unity thing and I've created my own version, which I prefer, which is completely code-based uh, and can run on a separate thread. Uh, because that, that is the problem, is that you cannot make the the standard Unity update method run on its own thread. Uh, it just won't. Uh, so what we do is we have all these object datas. And here's another thing that might, people might find interesting. Every single object in the entire game is represented by this single class. It's a little bit like a game object, I guess, from Unity. So uh, I will explain later in this episode how we define different behavior for different objects. Uh, and that is, I think, at the very core of the simulation. I think it's the most interesting bit. But this is all background information. Um, after we've updated the objects, we update a few other things that are not attached to objects. So we have things like uh, we update the staff manager, the player data. This is kind of like resources um, and uh, yeah, anything that doesn't isn't tied to, a, to an object itself. Um, and, and here is an, an example of a, um, an event subscriber, which I will be talking about more. So here, when the, if the floor grid has been updated because we've placed something down, uh, then what we do is we go through all the objects and we call this event. Now, I've created my own event subscriber uh, system, although I actually had a little bit of help. Uh, a, a programmer uh, friend of mine uh, actually lent me some of the... Some of the, the the core code for this so i i uh uh big shout out to dan pusey uh <laughs> if he's watching uh and uh anyway what this basically does is this um this event here is actually just a string it's called uh floor grid updated well and and actually i can show you this it's just a string and it's it's called floor grid updated um and what this does is this goes to the object data and it says, have we got anybody who subscribed to this particular event? And if so, then we will um, call uh, a method that they have subscribed to this event name. Um, and this allows us to keep our um, object behaviors really nice and decoupled. Uh, and it's very similar to the component method that Unity uses on its own objects. Uh, again, but it's my own version, which is completely data driven and doesn't uh, that can run on on a, on a separate thread. Um, and I will I th I'll I'll explain a little bit more how that works in a moment. Um, so if we go through to O dot update, now we are on the actual um, actual object data class. Um, and as I said before, this can represent every single object in the game. Um, let me explain a little bit about how that works. Um, you know, I'm just going to need to set up a separate window in OBS. So if you just give me a moment, I will be back. Okay, uh, so I'm back. So here you can see Notepad, a very messy Notepad with loads of tabs open. Um, in fact, I'm currently looking at a uh, uh, I'm currently looking at a save file. So what I'm just going to quickly do is open up a um, 
different one. So we got all these different data files. Um, and I'm going to show you fish if I can find them. Okay, so uh, basically each of these data files um, holds a load of um, object specs. Uh, spec short for specification and this determines the behavior of the object. So this isn't an object in itself This is a, uh, a class of object if you like, but it, it's not a class it, it because uh, Like I say, there's only one class for all objects <clears throat> um, This is an object spec and uh, within that we have uh, this is in JSON by the way uh, We have behaviors defined on our object now you don't have to understand JSON, you don't have to be a programmer to, to kind of understand what this, this file is doing. But essentially what we're saying is, um, we give it an ID, we have tags, tags are just things that we can check against. Uh, it's an animal. Uh, we have a hosting behavior here, and we say that this is hosted on a tank. Um, we could have something hosted on floor, we could have something hosted on something else. Currently things are only hosted on floor and tank. But if I wanted to, I could have a completely different type of container that things could be hosted on. Here is the animal uh, information, um, and this is where we define what is specific about this particular type of object. Uh, and in this case, this particular type of animal. So it has a starting size of two. Here is the growth schedule that you will have seen if you've been watching the video blogs, and we have the starting traits here. So we have two traits, one which is ID colorful value two, ID hardy value two. And then we have uh, the way that this particular object moves around. So it has a spot movement, which means that it moves from spot to spot in the tank with a certain speed. And the shoal size is the number of fish that we have inside each shoal. So things like Azur de Marzelle, some of the other damselfish, they have a shoal size greater than one, which means that there's multiple instances of this particular fish in the tank, um, so that the tanks feel a bit more full when you have these very small fish. And finally, we have FBX information. This is about visualization, which I'm not going to go into detail on. Now, um, what's interesting is that you can, these different behaviors, uh, they can be shared by different objects, but they don't have to come as a group. Now, this is what makes it like a component uh, method of class uh, definition or behavior definition, I guess, compared to a hierarchical uh, system. So what we can do is, for example, you, if we move to a tank, um, let me get the tanks up. Uh, then a tank also has a hosting um, spec. Now it can be hosted on the floor and its host tag is tank, which means that this uh, things that can be hosted on tank, like our fish, right, will be hosted on where is it? There it is. Uh, on this, can be hosted on this. Um, it has, instead of a contained behavior, it has a container behavior, which determines the boundaries of, of where the fish can swim inside it. Uh, and then we have this map thing, which I'm not going to go into detail into. Um, uh, we have a mobile, which shows that this is an immobile object that you place, and it, it, it fills up the space that it, it's, it, it, it's play where it's placed so that people can't walk there, which is very different to a fish. Um, but and what you'll notice is some of these behaviors are the same as, as the fish has. For example, the FBX... Um, the tags, the ID, I guess, um, and the hosting behavior, but it's a different type. And some of them are different. And that is at the core of the system. And it's a component model, which means that we can, the, the components can be kind of added as and when they are needed. Uh, and this allows us to have a single object, which uh, a single class object data. If I jump back to our code, uh, which, which represents every single object in the game. Now, uh, the final thing, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong place, right. Final thing I wanted to show you guys is the um, is an example of an object behavior. So here we have the animal spec. Uh, and if we jump back to notepad again, we can see that that's here, okay? Um, and this defines all of the behavior to do with the, this being an animal, so being a living creature as opposed to a tank, which is an inanimate object. Uh, and I'm going to explain the uh, system of callbacks that I mentioned a little bit earlier, a little in a little bit more detail. So what we have here is this, we have this little hook called register callbacks, where we can subscribe to all of these different events. So we have init, create, post assigned to game scene, new day, feed. These get called when these actions happen. 
So what this allows us to do is initialization basically happens whenever the gate whenever an object is created or loaded so we can cache variables during this 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 time um, create only ever happens when it's created and again if you're familiar with unity it's it's just an event subscriber system it's a way of hooking into certain things happening um, in this very independent decoupled way so the object data for example doesn't know which uh, behaviors are attached to it. Those are defined in the, the, the spec that we were looking at. So all the object data does is it goes, okay, who wants an init event? Who wants a create event? And it just sends out these uh, essentially messages to, to do these, these uh, call these methods. Um, and that allows us to do all sorts of interesting things. So um, I, I'm gonna talk you through kind of some of the stuff that this class does. Um, so, what we do when we create it, for example, is we go through its traits and we instantize those within this particular instance of the object. We clone them um, and we initialize its starting size because these are two things that change over time, right? We both know this, like the, the, the traits, they can increase, the size can increase. And we set it unfed because it's not been fed today. Um, we set it's new today, which means that it won't go hungry if you don't feed it today uh, because that's kind of a little bit unfair. Um, now we have at the end of the day uh, if it's if the fish has been fed fred <laughs> if the fish has been fed then what we do as long as it's the first time that it's reached a new uh, if this is the the biggest it's ever got uh, then we check whether there is some kind of growth so if it's a stat up growth then what we do is we randomly choose a, a trait we increase the trait uh, and we make a reference to the last trait increased, which is just for graphical reasons uh, when we show it in the day summary page. If it's a size up growth, then we increase the size. If it's not been fed today, uh, then we have this. This is actually some new code I've just done. So what this says is if it's not hungry and if uh, it's not currently affected by some kind of mood modifier uh, with the ID hungry, uh, then we create a new mood modifier, which uh, affects the happiness of the fish. Basically, it gets a bit grumpy. If it's already hungry, then it actually goes to starving, which makes it really, really unhappy. So it's really bad if you don't if you don't feed a fish two days in a row. And in fact, it will start to lose stats, which is what's happening here. <clears throat> um, and then uh, on a new day uh, is when we um, update the days that how, how how many days the fish has been fed um if it's if this is a similar logic to before if it's already been hungry for two days then what we'll do is we'll actually decrease it's starving it, it loses a block um and that's how the feeding stuff and then here we have the other end of it so there's this, a, a feed um event uh which gets called when a staff member feeds the the fish and what we do is we set it fed uh we also mark the task uh uh, complete uh, that it's been fed and this is a whole other you know system is the way that I, I uh, divvy out tasks okay I am going to wrap up this video there so you know the point of this is not really the specifics of how the animals work and all that sort of stuff I mean I cannot describe every single class to you guys it would take hours and hours now I think how long it's taken me to write this stuff but hopefully you can get an idea into the uh, system, the, the framework that I use to define the behavior of the objects, which is absolutely key to making a simulation game uh, like Mega Aquarium. Uh, it's, it's a, you have to have a different way of thinking about game development, I think, with a simulation game compared to, say, a game which is driven by a player character. Uh, you have to have this, this system in place that allows lots and lots of instances of objects with different interlocking behaviors to interact in interesting ways and the system that i've kind of shown to you today this idea of having objects with a, a spec which has a component model of uh, attaching behaviors to it so that those behaviors can be shared and not shared um, and you can pick and choose which behaviors you need for a particular object type having that and then coupling that with this <clears throat> event subscriber system where each behavior subscribes to a set of events so that it can do certain actions 
at certain trigger points. Having those two things together makes this system, which is actually incredibly easy to define new behavior. Um, you know, I just spent two days working on the happiness mechanic and I've got a really, you know, great grounding there already. And if I want to add a new behavior, which affects happiness, that's relatively easy. Um, you know, what? I'm just going to jump back to the code for one more second, which is if I pop up to here, we've got this get mood subscriber here. Um, and if I follow that through, you can see here what it does. Default mood is 80 for an animal, but this is only for animals. Um, there are guests and staff which have a different behavior attached and they have a different way of providing mood. But because of this event subscriber model, um, what we can do is the a diff, you know a staff and a guest won't have an animal component. They will have a staff or a guest component attached and they will subscribe to this event instead. So when the object says, oh, what's my mood? Because I want to show a smiley face in the corner of my little thumb, uh, then it doesn't have to know whether it's an animal or it's a guest or it's a staff. It just says, what's my mood? And it will it'll show that. And that decoupled system is really powerful. It allows me to make different object types that act in slightly different ways, but integrate into the system in a consistent way so that we can then show that information to the user via visual feedback and user interface. So there we go. <laughs> please give me some feedback on this video, like seriously. Uh, please let me know if I'm like moving too fast. Do you want me to talk about code more? Is this too deep? Is it not? Is it not top level enough? Um, give me some feedback. What do you want to hear about? What parts of the game would you like me to to, to explain? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, just just let me know. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed it, then as always, and if you haven't, hit that subscribe button, uh, which follows this. And uh, yeah, please please feedback something back to me. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Bye bye.